Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call to order this regular Board of Ed meeting. All rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Okay, so we have first on our uh, list of agenda items is our student council report from Sarah Valla. Sarah. Good evening. Hi. Yep. Cool. Good evening. Um, so it's been a while since I've last spoken, and we've had quite a few things happen. <laughs> so I'm going to go over the student life section first. We had our open house on the 6th, and then leading into Spirit Week, which I'll talk about a little later in the student council section, we had Chris Collins a motivational speaker come visit us to kick off Spirit Week in the lower gym, as well as provide a, um, offer a leadership workshop for all the leaders in our school, and which in which he talked about qualities of a leader. He helped us go over Student Senate, and we pretty much just engaged in a nice conversation about that. <clears throat> we also announced our valedictorian and salutatorian, which is Zoe Gutherman and Andrew Detella, so many congratulations to them. And as for upcoming events, we have the SHS PTSA Community Service Fair on the 21st. We have Red Ribbon Week starting next week, and we also have our Disney in Concert on the 26th at 7 o'clock in the auditorium at the high school. Um, moving on to athletics, we won our homecoming game against Pelham. <laughs> it's really good. And by doing that, therefore, we are now the number one ranked football team in the state. Wow. wow. And then with that, we also have our girls' soccer team, which is ranked 11th in the state. All right. And finally, we also have our boys and girls' soccer and field hockey teams having their home games for their first round of sectionals. Okay. So a lot of exciting things happening there. Moving on to counseling. We have, we're starting, continuing our college representative visits from all across the country. They've been coming in person and through Zoom. And it's a great opportunity for students to connect with those college representatives, the dean of admissions, typically, and learn more about the school and also build those good connections. So, you know, if you want to apply to a college, they'll be like, hey, this student met with me. <laughs> and then we had a wrap up of senior meetings in which seniors got to meet with their counselors and talk about future plans. Uh, we had the PSAT administered on Saturday, the October 15th. Uh, we had a lot of students sign up, both sophomores, junior, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And we also began the introduction of Wellness Wednesdays, which is headed by the counseling department and offered to students every Wednesday during community lunch in which they could go over different topics involving wellness and all that good stuff. And fin our final segment of the day pertains to student council activities. So as you may know, we had our spirit week, which um, unfortunately fell on the three-day week, but we managed to fill those spaces in with a bonfire celebration and a homecoming dance. Both are revived events. Um, so for Spirit Week, we had that from the 7th, the 12th, the 11th, uh, the 13th, and the 14th, excuse me. And we had our pep rally. We had the homecoming dance on the 15th. The theme was Enchanted Forest. We had a lot of people come. It was a great thing. And the bonfire celebration was also an amazing thing. Thank you to the Purdy's Fire Department, or the Summers Volunteer Fire Department, for helping us out. And the senior class, moving into class board, the senior class also had their uh, Krispy Kreme sale, in which they were able to raise funds for our future prom event. And we have three future events coming up, We or four, excuse me. We have the Class of 2025's Haunted House, which is taking place this Saturday at 7 o'clock. We have the uh, Senior Apple Picking Trip, which is taking place on the 28th. And we have selected 10 students to come attend the Media Literacy event in New York City, which is uh, an event sponsored by Twitter which helps, pr um, which meets with student leaders and discusses topics of media literacy. So it's a great opportunity. We've chosen 10 students to attend, uh, mostly presidents from the class boards and the executive board. And along with that, um, student council is planning for the NYSC LSA trip, which is a giant leadership conference um, in the state of New York in which we'll be meeting in Niagara Falls to pretty much talk about leadership things. And it's a really fun bonding event. You learn a lot of cool things and you meet a lot of new people. And 
that's about it. It's a lot, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Sarah. Wow. Thank you, Sarah. So many incredible things happening in our schools. Um, excellent. All right, so board, we have the first of two public comments coming up. Uh, and a reminder to folks that the public comments, we have two sections, and the reason why your board made two public comments is so that the first public comment could be about agenda items. So just to, to share, on the central office report for today, we'll be talking about the annual social and emotional wellness report, the energy performance contract update, uh, and then we have some board action. So again, the very first public comment is about specifically agenda items. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, just to be clear, we are convening into the public comment section of our meeting, and state law does not necessarily require us to hold a public comment period, but we as the Somer Central School District Board of Education have chosen to do so because we believe that it is crucial to listen to you, our community, uh, and to hear from you about your concerns and your issues. So having said that, please know that the board is here to listen. Uh, the public comment period is not designed to be a discussion. Accordingly, please do not expect the board to respond to concerns or questions tonight. This is because we take your concerns seriously, and we do need to take the time, and we wanna have sufficient time to process and research those issues that you share. Um, we will, however, respond to your questions and concerns at a future meeting or have the proper staff and faculty get back to you at the, pro at the appropriate time. Uh, we want to point out that under the state and federal privacy laws, we are unable to entertain questions and comments about personnel. Okay. Uh, however, please know we take personnel questions and concerns very seriously, so on these matters, we would ask that you go through the appropriate channels, starting with the administrators in your student's building and moving up through the district uh, as, as typically uh, encouraged. So finally, um, look, we recognize that uh, right now our nation and our community are polarized in a number of issues. And that said, we want our school board meetings to serve as an example to our students that members of our school board and members of our community can deal with controversial issues in a civil manner and demonstrate mutual respect for one another. So in that spirit, we will insist that all speakers and members of the audience maintain civility and respect for any divergent views that others possess. We ask that all speakers please address their comments, not questions, but comments to the board directly to the board. Uh, we have a maximum of 30 minutes that we have in our policy, which is limited to three minutes per speaker. We ask that all written statements be given to the district clerk uh, for inclusion into the public record. Uh, again, two sessions. This is about the board agenda. And again, we ask all community members who do step up to the podium to make a public comment to write their name, email, and the school their child attends within our district so we can get back to them accordingly. Whew. With that said, if you have any comments about what is on the agenda, please come to the podium. I will not read that again next time. Thank you. Um, so my name is Sarah Kaloris, and I just want to make a statement, and I'm not sure exactly if it's in alignment with the agenda because it was kind of just rushed through. But the board keeps saying that they're not involved in the interviewing and hiring process, but the reality is you are. At the last meeting, Ms. Portnoy mentioned that the final step was when the candidate's name came through the board to approve or deny the consent agenda. Did any of you look into this person individually before you approved or denied the hire? Did any of you read her book or listen to her podcast? I find it impossible to believe that the board would just blindly approve the hire if they didn't do their due diligence. And if you did do it and still hired her, then there is a much larger problem here. The board had the ability to deny her hiring, did you not? But you chose to approve it, and therefore you are not only involved in the hiring process, but you're actually the final step in the hiring process. And at any point during that vote, you could have stopped it or negated the vote, but you didn't, and therein lies the problem. Dr. Blanche also stated that the DEI hire has been keeping in alignment with the job description since her hire date. My question is, how do you know that? I cannot imagine someone who has such strong core beliefs will not carry them through these doors. Clearly, they are ingrained in her as much as her love of the word whiteness. 
And as far as the constant comment that the board doesn't control anything, that also really isn't true. You are directly responsible for hiring the superintendent, choosing to whether to extend his contract or not, et cetera. So clearly there's a big conflict of interest here. If the superintendent doesn't play nicely or go along with the board's feelings, you have the option of choosing not to renew his contract. So the board has a lot more power than you guys are claiming to have. You control the hiring of the superintendent of the school, literally the highest position there is. That's basically like the mailroom staff deciding on who hires the CEO. It doesn't happen in the outside world and it shouldn't happen here. Again, the board who claims to have no power at all is in charge of hiring the superintendent as well as having the final say in the hiring of the DEI position. And that sounds pretty powerful to me. Parents are waking up and the veil is being lifted and the majority are extremely unhappy about this new hire as you can see. Luckily, because apparently I did win the genetic lottery, I was able to pull my younger son out of the district this year and send him to a private school to remove him from this new woke culture that seems to be taking place in Somers. My older son has severe autism, so this really doesn't affect him whatsoever, but if it does trickle down to his classroom, we've always instilled in him to be proud of who he is. That includes his autism, his hair color, his eye color, and yes, even his skin color, because that is who God made him. That being said, this still affects me as a parent, a taxpayer, a resident, and a white woman. We are no longer going to sit idly by while the Board of Ed passes the buck and sits there looking dumbfounded. We were promised question and answer sessions with the board, which literally you just reiterated, but that has never happened. When I have requested meetings in the past, they were dodged by Dr. Blanche and all of my questions were never truly answered. We don't want finger pointing, blame games, blank stares, reference to BOE policies and whispers between board members. We want answers and we're not gonna stop asking them and showing up until we get them and as parents, we deserve them. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your public comment. If any other members of the community would like to come and address the board with their comments, not questions, about the items on the agenda, which of course include the social emotional wellness report and the energy performance contract update, please go ahead and do so now. Yeah, because the DEI coordinator is not on the... That's correct. That is correct. We can definitely take that later after we get through the business. Absolutely. Well, I guess I'm out of order. I'm Dom DiMartino, a couple of guys met me last week, probably didn't know who I was until just last week. I'm here mostly to talk about trust and integrity. We trusted our school administrators to provide the best learning environment for my kids. I'll g give you credit, during COVID shutdowns and mass mandates, I felt our district did a pretty good job managing state, federal directives while getting our kids in the classroom. Did I agree with everything? No. But overall, compared to most districts, we did much better. Mm -hmm. I was debating a lot on what I was going to planning what I was planning to say today. I think a lot of people are going to come up here and be confrontational. That was my plan. If you saw me Monday, that's what I did. But I think we need to calm down and speak more reasonably. Like I said last week, none of us are challenging the DEI position or the need for a DEI officer. We're challenging the person that was hired. I met with Susan last week and I was at her seat meeting today. I'll be honest, she didn't seem like a bad person at face value. She seemed very pleasant and nice enough. With that being said, I find it very difficult to trust her. This is a very delicate position, especially with all the divisiveness going on. Mm -hmm. You brought in a person who was supposed to create a, create a safe and welcoming environment for the Italian community, but you've done the exact opposite. There are many people in this town who are scared by this hiring but they fear speaking up. They're afraid to risk their jobs, their businesses, or livelihoods. I've had many people come up to me. I've had many teachers in this school district who are saying, oh, we're starting to get meeting requests from her. I'm trying to hide. They're afraid to answer up. They're afraid to, to step out of line for repercussions for their careers. Unfortunately, the buzzword to shut down differing opinions is to scream racism and break out the torches and pitchforks. We're still teaching the Salem witch trials in school, right? You know, maybe the community should take a refresher course. In the past week, many people, I want to speak out. I have too much to lose. This is the exact opposite of what you claim you brought this person in to do. We can go back and forth picking quotes from the book and arguing interpretations. A lot of people know I have. <clears throat> My big takeaway is if somebody can find racism in math and sunscreen, 
They can find it anywhere. How can any of us or our children confide in this person? I understand the administrators put themselves in a rough situation and they haven't helped themselves with roundabout contradicting answers. As I mentioned earlier, Susan seems like a decent enough person, but how do we trust her? What happens if she gets tenure? Is this when the book comes into practice? I think a very easy suggestion and a reasonable outcourse with this, start a search for a new DEI person, let her finish out the year, and let's move along with somebody more transparent, with less baggage, and if they wrote a book, let's read it this time. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I'd like to reiterate to anybody who might be joining us to share comments uh, in the future that under the state and federal privacy laws, we are unable to entertain questions or comments about individual personnel. Okay, so please let's try to abide by that legal requirement. Okay, so without any additional public comment about the annual social emotional wellness or energy performance contract, uh, Dr. Blanche, I do believe we are at the central office report. Yep, so we'll go ahead and uh, see if I can turn it over to Mr. Kavanaugh. And I think we've got our projector working up here. So mm -hmm. thank you, Ms. Kavikoff, for coming this evening. And we'll kind of go over have some of our K through 12 lens in the school. So thank you, sir. Good evening. Just, uh, all right. Good e Am I on, Paul? OK. All right. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Blanche, board, community. Uh, and I think I should probably start off as much as it pains me to wish all our Yankee fans congratulations. I do believe they, <laughs> they have won. Uh, yeah. Uh, as a uh, Met fan, I am practicing my DBT skills of radical acceptance, which I'll explain to you <laughs> in, in a few minutes. Uh, so uh, if we could uh, move on to the first slide. So we had, uh, th traditionally, this has been a school counseling report, and our school counselors are so enmeshed with our entire wellness team that we've decided to uh, rebrand this, so to speak, and really take a look at our entire uh, wellness team. Our wellness team consists of school, so school counselors, school psychologists, school social workers, and of course our uh, invaluable administrative support <laughs> staff uh, who work to deliver uh, our mission to all 2,700 students, K through 12. Uh, as you can see on this slide, that mission is to teach, uh, our mission is, uh, as a mental health team, is to teach and model for all students the lifelong skills of self-regulation, self-management, and effective social engagement. Uh, the development of these skills will positively affect students' ability to learn, students' school and personal behaviors, and students' connectedness to their community. Uh, it, one of the things I've been going around uh, having some conversations, which I'll get to in a little while, about our uh, new wellness uh, survey, the Co-Vitality Wellness Survey. One of the things that I uh, talk about is when we talk about preparing our students, we know that when our students are well emotionally, they are best prepared to learn. Any of us as adults know that, that when we are not well emotionally, we are not in a good position to learn. Uh, we're not open and receptive to what's, what the information that we're getting. One of the things that we think about when we think about preparing our students for the next step, our position and our uh, goal throughout Somers is to prepare our students for the world. And while we do a very good job academically, we are still in the growth process of preparing students emotionally. Uh, just uh, actually as of yesterday, talking to, and I, I mentioned in those presentations how one of the <coughs> things that we see is students struggling on the college front. Uh, that they can handle the academics, but a lot of times our students are struggling emotionally when they get to college. And just talking to our college and career counselor who's meeting daily with numerous college representatives, asking him what, always oh, talking about what trends they're seeing. Uh, I, was really struck by the, the collective response he, he passed along was that the, every representative was saying, our psych services are stretched thin to the point of being overwhelmed. That's at the college level. Um, and they also said, interestingly enough, they said this is uh, coupled with, an, uh, with a dramatic increase in managing parental anxiety as well too. So this is a very re real scenario that, that we have on our hands. So uh, if we could go to the, the next. Um, and apologize if you can't see that too clearly. So our action steps to support this mission uh, can be seen in these larger, or maybe not seen so clearly, in these, in these larger connected systems of work. The vast majority of the work is focused on what we call direct services. So you have the core SEW instruction, if you can see that, uh, the academic planning and, and support, family partnerships. Um, we also have uh, more intense mental health support uh, and transition planning, and then the indirect support services. By indirect services, uh, and the, those direct services when we're working directly with student parent, indirect services includes work on a student or parent's behalf, 
We have uh, all of the team members that I spoke about there, as well, in addition to other school staff and administration, work on with our whole child success team meetings, care meetings, uh, team meetings here at the middle school, or transition meetings, especially between buildings. Those are just a few of the indirect services that these teams provide. Uh, we start with a broader reach to all students, and then we tailor that to focus uh, and be responsive to individual needs. So. This boils down to a tiered uh, support. Some of you, this may look like a very uh, familiar structure. Uh, in fact, uh, and you'll see, see there's a direct call to academics. There's a major focus for us here as a district to have our academic and uh, social emotional supports work in unison. Uh, these two areas have traditionally run in parallel lanes uh, where you have the academic support on one side, the uh, social emotional on the other. Uh, but as we know for our students, the academic and social emotional are, are always intertwined. So while we've delivered them separately for every student, we know that they go hand in hand. Uh, Supporting both for every student is really the most effective way to positively uh, influence their learning. This is a very general overview of, uh, of, of, of what, is, what we mean by multi-tiered systems of support, MTSS. So many of you may hear that acronym. I know in education we're big on acronyms to <laughs> confuse everyone, but multi, that is that intertwining of the academic and the social emotional is, is what we mean by that multi-tiered systems of support. Uh, within our district, this work, uh, this is the work that Dina Miller is, is leading, uh, along with uh, support, obviously, from Kevin Guadotti, Claire Comerford, myself, and of, of course, Dr. Blanche as well. Okay. So what does this look like for our students? Uh, as you look at this, this roadmap here, uh, we won't be able to capture the full breadth of social emotional work across the schools uh, as it happens in different classrooms and different offices every day. Uh, but these are really the high points. And again, these are what you see here are developmental pieces that uh, with, with a common focus on teaching practical strategies for students to manage their emotions day to day and be present for their learning. It begins very early with, with our responsive classroom program where students are taught to really be a, a contributing member of a school classroom community. How can I be an effective member of this classroom community? Uh, that moves on just a few years ago. We took on zones of regulation. Uh, zones of regulation is a program where students learn to uh, identify the emotion they're experiencing. Uh, our students learn that once we acknowledge and name that emotion, that we're less ruled by it. Uh, this is a beginning stage of developing presence of mind and self-awareness. Uh, it also helps to expand our vocabulary. We realize our kids, when you are learning something and then you have an emotional connection to it, there's more a likelihood that you're going to retain that information. Um, and it's a good way for students to move into more involved language to, to try to address how they're feeling at the moment. And again, once you have to stop and address that feeling, you've already taken some positive steps forward. Uh, the second step program, which is in grades, we practice that in grades two to five. That takes uh, the second step program, the, sorry, zones of regulation where you're acknowledging the emotion and figures out what do I do with it? I know how I feel, now what do I do with it? Um, our students, le students learn to brainstorm positive uh, solutions through second step, explore consequences, which also too, that exploring consequences is very uh, much a reinforcer and teacher of executive functioning skills, uh, and how to make a plan how to make a plan to, if this is what I need to do, how can I make a plan to accomplish that? Mm -hmm. uh, they begin to understand uh, intentional breathing, removing blame, and positive self-talk. The other major program that we have is DBT Steps A, where our students uh, learn to understand competing perspectives. DBT is a complicated term, dialectical behavior therapy. By di dialectical, we just mean that there, you can have two opposing truths at the same time, and both can be equally true, and how do you live within that? Um, it, it teaches kids how to be present for the sake of learning. If I'm worried about what happened before or what happened later, there's no way I'm going to be effective right now in what's going on in this classroom. Uh, how to operate in their wise mind. This is a really important concept. You can either act in a reality mind uh, or reasonable mind where it's, it's only logic and facts and it's cold or emotion mind where you're not really thinking logically because you're ruled by emotion. In the middle there is what we, what we try to teach kids is, is wise mind. Uh, and also how to get, engage in radical acceptance, as I explained earlier. As a Met fan, I have worked on that uh, for years now. <laughs> um, so we can go on to the next one. Uh, this was, as I can explain all this to you, tell you what we're doing, but these were a few quotes from some of our students. Um, and rather than, uh, and, and these were students in grades 
6 and 10 specifically last year when we did after we did our lessons the the uh, dbt lessons they go through six grade six this year they'll be six eight and ten but last year they were in grade six and ten and we just had students give us a little feedback I was thinking maybe uh our uh, board may take uh take some time and actually read aloud some of these quotes for rather than hearing me read them sure. let's jump in there all right i'll read one uh, dialectics has stuck with me as i find myself thinking about how i say what i want to say and the way i communicate with others Mindfulness and wise mind stuck with me because I get stressed easily and I have to use these tips a lot to calm down. <laughs> yes. Ife, you're up. I use the skills from check the facts and what opposite action to help me get through my National Honor Society speech. It's a very small. Yeah, I zoomed in. <laughs> yes, 110% I apply them. Throughout my day, I usually use mindfulness breathing or just to refocus from the little things like a hard test or the drama that is not needed. Mm. I've been trying to incorporate wise mind more into my daily life, which has helped me to better think through a situation and not let my emotions get too strong and prevent me from making a good decision. I've been able to use dialectic thinking to resolve arguments quicker by thinking about what the other person is thinking and feeling. The idea of the wave skill and checking the facts stuck with me the most because I thought it was a smart way to not let your emotions take control of you. Amazing kids. Uh, it, These are all from yeah. kids? Those are directly from kids, yeah. Uh, Sixth and 10th graders? That, yep, this was from last year, sixth and 10th grade. They're both in, this was both from their wellness classes, uh, which our teachers have been phenomenal in, in uh, partnering with our mental health team. And uh, some of them have been trained with the DBT Steps A. Uh, and, and I should say also too, when you hear DBT, DBT is a very involved therapy. This is not involved therapy. Steps A is, is a very, uh, we'd say DBT light. Uh, just giving the core skills from there, but it's, I, I think it's pretty powerful to see, the, see the, the statements from the kids and how much it affects them. To us, again, if, if the work that we can do affects only a few kids, uh, we're way ahead of the game, but as we're starting to see with this work, we're affecting a lot more, and the goal is to, to teach these skills, and as you, I hope you could see the connection from these skills from really from kindergarten all the way through when we are at the end of our curriculum in, in 10th grade, uh, how these are developmental and how they try to build upon each other so that when kids get to that point, they can incorporate them much more easily into their everyday experience. So yeah. Phil, just a point of clarity, the, the slide before where you're s sort of showing some of the programs that our district invests in for our kids starting from kindergarten, maybe even pre-K now, yeah. all the way through 12th grade, um, the responsive classroom is, is teacher-led, correct? That is, that is teacher-led, yes. Yep. Whereas the zones of regulation is really student-centered, yep. is that right? Yes. And what we're trying to more and more is, is get less focused on this is when it comes to social emotional well, that it's uh, to draw less of those clear dividing lines. So a uh, teacher may be incorporating responsive classroom, but have someone from the wellness team come in to support a given mm -hmm. challenge that the class might be experiencing with that. Sorry. Nice, thank you. Uh, and just uh, as you bring back to this slide, the other significant pieces too that our, our folks are involved with is, is the, uh, the transitions. Obviously from every grade is significant, as you all know if you have students, as they move from into kindergarten, then into SIS and in between buildings, Every transition has its challenges, and so that is a, a significant focus of our work. We also do a self-care program in ninth grade. Uh, it used to be a su suicide prevention program, um, and, and we thought it was effective, but our team got together and said, we need to focus more on just giving the kids tools for self-care, and so that every ninth grader is exposed to that. And obviously, college and career planning it begins actually in middle school uh, and carries on through, uh, through senior year of, of high school. Um, just for perspective there, I think already, uh, what are our numbers with that? We already have, believe it or not, where are we? October 18th, already uh, we're in process of 2,264 applications as of October 18th, wow. just to offer some perspective there. Um, and on the flip side, just on, on the psych support piece, uh, we, we're currently managing 143 mandated counseling services, uh, and already uh, we're in October and we have 88 already uh, school-based, uh, non-mandated counseling uh, services that are being delivered. So, if we, yep, go. All right. So, I mentioned at the start, uh, and I know everybody's got communication about this. I've I've gone to uh, open houses about this, so I I don't 
believe anybody needs to hear too much more, but we identified this SEL screener, this social emotional health survey. Uh, we have a couple of quotes there from, from students as well too, uh, just about, and some, sometimes when we see especially the feedback from kids, that's what's really reinforcing for us. Um, you know, I, I hope that it helps adults understand me better. To me, that is the most important thing, and that is really the purpose of this. Uh, one of the people who trains us in DBT skills always says, if we can catch problems upstream, we're gonna be way ahead of the game. And that's the goal here with this screener, is all too often we have to be reactive and responsive in our work, and this gives us the opportunity to be proactive, uh, to, to offer interventions much earlier. Sometimes they're very small. I can tell you from some experiences that we've had already, it's just a matter of getting this student connected to this experience. Uh, this student really is, you know, they just, uh, their friend group just broke apart, and they don't, all of a sudden they're feeling like they're, they have no connection. From my point of view, and from our staff's point of view, if we're having that conversation in October instead of June, after everybody's wondering why the grades have gone down so much, this is a win already. Um, this is our first blush at it. Counselors are already meeting with, uh, with students who came up as, as that there are areas of concern, uh, according to the, the survey, that they would be determined to be struggling at this moment. Again, this is a very brief snapshot in time but so that we're having those conversations, connecting with parents, it's another opportunity for real positive uh, phone calls with parents, and all of it, at the end of the day, is just more opportunity to talk about mental health. As much as we're talking about it, then we're again taking steps forward. When we're asking kids questions about it, we're taking steps forward, um, just to, that we, we can be practiced in the conversation. I always say, we ask people how you're doing, when's the last time somebody said to you, how are you doing emotionally? And this is what that's asking the kids, giving them time to pause and think and reflect about that. Yeah. So you do the, um, the survey, what, twice a year? Once the, the beginning? The once plan is for right now, twice a year. So we'll have it, we had it in September, and we'd uh, administer it again in March. Is this the first year of doing this? This is. We did a pilot last year, but this is the first year that we're surveying all students. Uh, when I say surveying all students, I think we had about, uh, at the secondary level, about 77% and about closer to 85 percent I want to say at in fifth grade and I don't know if I said that it's fifth through twelfth and the, the fifth grade survey that students take is very different from the secondary survey uh, all these these buckets that you see that are being assessed here uh, for the this is the secondary version the primary version uh, only assesses for uh, four specific areas it's a it's a much more trimmed down assessment is this data for the students to see or is it for or is it for also for you to do something with it is both uh, the, it was one of the, in, in speaking to students in our pilot, uh, at, when we had discussions with students after the pilot, this was one of them. I can remember, I always use the example, one student said, We've, we get poked and prodded with a lot of different surveys. This is one I really want to see the results for. Um, and so that's as, actually this Friday afternoon, we're going to be posting to Backpack. Uh, and we'll be sending out a notice just letting people know that it's, that it's there for your review if your student took the survey. So again, again, not every student took it, so it won't be on every student's backpack. It is there for our mental health team, especially to see, uh, you know, is, is there a specific challenge and those we're already ad working to address. It could also be for a student who's doing very well, who at a certain time maybe hits a little bump in the road, and then it could offer a clue to say, how can we best help them? This survey is focused on strengths. So many things that we researched were focused on deficits, and we realized that if we knew every kid's strengths, we could then best help them. So if they're struggling with something, we could use those strengths and leverage those strengths to help them move forward. So that's really the, uh, so it could be used, uh, you know, all throughout the year if a student is, is struggling and saying, okay, what, what can we do here? Um, the biggest thing I'm hoping is that students themselves, when they get this at home, what we ask them to do is try to move one thing forward. If I'm all, even if I, I have so many strengths, there's gonna be areas for growth and areas to enhance. That's the way this comes out. If I pick one thing, and I improve that one thing, there'll be a domino effect into other areas. I can keep my focus you know, small and saying, let me just work on this one thing. And that's what we ask everyone. When you get that home, is just to say, sit down, have the student take a look at it, see what, what they think of it, and then pick one thing that they want to work on. And it'll be a win if you work on that one thing. So, yeah. um, I, I don't understand much of this yet, but I, want to ask a question to, to sort of try to help me to elevate onto the level you're talking. How are you correlate this with the so-called student factors that I sort of know about, you know, social, emotion, wellness, 
the student factors that I read about before is the five factors, right? Homework, test, relationship, that's teacher-student relationship, student-student relationship, physical activity, sports, whatever, after-school activities. These five factors have been identified by a lot of researchers in this SEL area as key factors. Each has its sort of problem or areas that which you know, your strengths is needed to deal with, okay? I, I just don't know whether you have already sort of aware of those. Are we, you know, in this school, have enough understanding or data, certain areas we could focus in, the tools that we have could be applicable? I mean, maybe this is a long question, but I, I would like you to elevate all of us to that right. level. Right, I, I think I understand what you're asking, but I, I think the um, social emotional wellness those would be disconnected from some of the things you're mentioning, like homework, mm -hmm. uh, that you wouldn't draw a direct line unless you know the homework was causing anxiety for the student. Um, which I think for most kids it, it does, but this, this is social emotional wellness is really about inevitably we're all going to face difficult situations. Without a doubt, we're going to face difficult situations. It's are we prepared to face those situations? Do you have the strengths? One of the things this, this survey assesses, in addition to strengths and what everyone will see, it's, it's your strengths, your areas to enhance, areas for growth, but it's also psychological distress. There's also school connectedness and life satisfaction. So especially when we balance that psychological distress with the strengths, do you have enough strengths to manage your current psychological distresses or your inevitable future ones? Um, and so that's what we're really working towards. When you mention physical fitness, of course, uh, there are, as anyone would tell you, the first thing usually if you're starting to figure out if you want to address your mental health, the first thing you address is actually your sleep uh, and how the, your quality of sleep. But I don't know if we want to get dig down into all that right now. <laughs> uh, but certainly that the goal here is that you be, that we teach our students again from kindergarten to the time they leave us, that they can manage their emotional challenges so that they're ready for the world, so that they, whether they go to college or the workforce, um, and I mentioned the college example, but it can equally be whether or not you can hold down a job. Can you show up on time? Can you keep to your work? Uh, will you be able to manage, uh, you know, direction from, a, from your supervisor? All those skills are the skills that we want our kids to leave with. So that's, that's. But our, our survey too, can we survey the students or, you know, find out some of the, so. The so Phil, if it's all right, I'm gonna just jump in for a second. So if the team has been working on, and it'll, um, Phil mentioned before, our whole shot success team. So uh, the engagement conversation we've had for years with the board, as we define that as looking at student social engagement, their behavioral engagement, their academic engagement. Mm -hmm. So this piece of information goes into a, what's identified as a, a, as a whole child screener element. So we do look at if students are, uh, academically how they're doing in their grades. We also look at are they coming to school and attending the school. Right. Are there any disciplinary behavioral issues that they're seeing in school? As well as do we look at uh, the um, participation in extracurricular activities? And then you bring in this co-vitality. So you're looking around seven or eight different indicators that are in there. So when you bring that body of evidence forth, it's that body of evidence that uh, underneath Phil's direction and the billing-based teams, they look at that information and say, okay, more than this, but this is an important piece because this is coming direct from kids. But what are we seeing from their grades? What are we seeing from their attendance? What are we seeing from their participation in the athletic activities or the extracurricular activities? So yes, that is a body of evidence that's looked here, drives all the way back to the district uh, mission person purpose of engaging all students. And this is what we define as engagement. Are you there academically, are you there socially, emotionally, and you're there cognitively? So this is a profile of that report, so yes. And Nick, I'm sorry, I think yeah, I jumped from, ahead From again. our you board point of view, I was just thinking whether we should put our attention say about academic, how the uh, tests or homeworks are, are handled in a way, are we students that are overburdened or less burdened or whatever, you know? Those are the, the data information probably of, if we have the tool, we should be able to accumulate and understand 
for so many schools where we should put our money or our attention to. And I would say just back to Phil's PowerPoint there with the body of um, the wellness team that's there because students may or may not present, I'm, I'm doing great in my grades and um, I'm participating in athletics, but there may be some elements that may cause us to go back and say there's some, some areas that are like red flags for us that we want to go look at. So it's trying to have as much of a full understanding of our, of our children and our students as we possibly can. Again, this is a piece we're trying to hear from the kids directly. And that's a part where we're looking at that being in, in, ingrained into the program. And, and as Phil mentioned before, the team at each school, they look at basically on a weekly basis of, of those kind of tick marks that they're watching across schools. Because a student may or may not have the best day maybe taking this, but there's a lot of other elements that continue to go through. So it's an ongoing kind of piece there. So, so I, I should have meant, oh, sorry. sorry. I well, so I'm, I'm curious, Eve. It sounds like, and correct me if I if I'm not getting this. You're talking about specific connection to content, and it sounds like this to me is just operationalizing that that um, engagement that we've been having conversations about for years. It seems like this is a formal tool for operationalizing what engagement looks like. And I'm tell me if this is if I have this right. Are we trying to help our our students use this language and the related skills around this language as sort of an umbrella to support them in their homework, in their tests, in their academic success, similar but not the same as, as like an IB profile of, you know, right, risk taker. But, but hopefully we know, we know our students' problems that, that then we would apply it in the right place. But we, I think the point is we know them because we're trying to get at, mm -hmm. at fundamentally what, where they're struggling or, or where they're succeeding and helping them see, like, look how great I'm doing at um, school support. Gosh, it'd be great if I had some more peer support. And then the schools, I'm making this up. I have no idea. You're both right. <laughs> is that, is, <laughs> so that we're, we're the, the uh, curriculum is designed to teach those skills. This is a, a, a measure to see where those skills are. Uh, and where their strengths are. So we may be, and this could also inform our instruction. So even the lessons that we choose for our steps A or our second step, we may adjust that based on the feedback that we get from our students. The other thing what I was gonna say is what I didn't mention is that we will, in addition to the student reports, we get school reports. So the schools have already started and will be, in the next couple of weeks, will be looking at their school-wide results and the faculty will be able to take a look at that and say, what do we wanna choose as one thing to move forward? So we ask students to choose one thing to move forward and the faculty are gonna be looking at one thing that they wanna move forward collectively as well too. So that, that's the next conversation. Um, so it's really just, there's tremendous opportunities here. Um, and with that, if we could, uh, this part of our next steps, when we look at our next steps, is, is to, for our families and for our schools to unpack co-vitality and, and look at the results, continue to develop and implement uh, the, our lessons, a lot of it based on that. Um, we also have talked before about youth mental health first aid training. I don't know if anybody in the room has experienced youth mental health first aid training. This is all about, uh, it's, not, uh, a, a, it's about how to identify challenges if a student is in your classroom or if you're a coach uh, or if you're a, uh, a club leader. And you, anyone who works with youth, how do I identify a student who's experiencing some challenges? And then not how do I, uh, how do I, I fix that or help the student come to it. It's how do I get them to the proper help? How do I know to identify it, to see it, and get them to the help they need? That's the Youth Mental Health First Aid. So I'll, what I would ask is that we, we don't, it's not the presentation piece, but I know you and I spoke the other day, these are great opportunities to give me a call, I'd love to talk to you about this and invite you to part. So yeah, that's okay. absolutely done, uh, absolutely. I have a question relative to this. Yep. And, and for the purpose of everybody here, nobody's gonna be allowed to ask any questions and get an answer. So right as we spoke the other day, again and tonight, is that it's a common peer for the Board of Education. When I spoke yesterday for about two hours in town, asked questions, and then even we have some PTA meetings coming up, those are opportunities to have questions. This, this is a Board of Education held in public, not a public open piece, so I appreciate I the clarity. Appreciate Absolutely. The PTA meeting is tomorrow. Correct, I'll try to reiterate the statement. But we'll answer questions tomorrow. So again, depending upon what those questions are, is any other piece? <laughs> yep. 
So again, I'll be very clear to the board before what you heard. I will not answer questions regarding personnel matters in public, nor should you. So that's a piece I will not do. Legally, we're bound not so to. I will not do. So Phil, I think you've got, you're wrapping up. Yep. Uh, so again, uh, we are also too exploring our wellness support systems. Uh, our team is going to be taking another, especially our student support team, is going to be taking a visit out to Stevenson High School and seeing there. Uh, structures to see uh, what our future possibilities are. We're also looking to engage, uh, explore professional learning opportunities, especially at the elementary level. One thing that we, we've noticed is our kids ch increase challenges uh, with executive functioning, with social skills, and really the gap in play uh, and, and the, the powerful impact of uh, play for kids. Uh, and, and so that, that's something that we're really focused on, especially at the elementary level. Uh, we have some great training coming up on that. The next last piece is related to co-vitality and related to all of this is our wellness uh, summit. That's on the third. Hopefully everyone got that notice. On the third, uh, we have Dr. Michael Furlong, uh, who is the author of the, uh, of the survey. Uh, he's going to be zooming in with us from uh, UC Santa Barbara, actually just recently retired, and talking about how and why he came up with the program. Most importantly, we're going to have breakout sessions. So when you get your uh, results at home and you see that your student, could, your child could use some, help, some work in a specific area, we will have uh, groups set up. It's, we have teams of parents, uh, staff members, and students who are going to walk uh, parents through some strategies that you can do at home. If you see your students struggling with, say, the, whether it's emotional competence or, or engaged living, you can go to those specific sessions and you'll, you'll get a, uh, a, a real quick uh, snapshot on what you could do practically at home tonight. To, to help that along. Uh, we're also planning to have some informational uh, pieces here too uh, for school clubs and activities and other things that if you are seeking to get and trying to help your uh, son or daughter get more connected to school that those opportunities are gonna be there. We encourage not just parents to come but students to come as well too so you don't have to translate the message at home which inevitably may fall on deaf ears if you live in my house. Hey Phil, just for clarification, the sessions, the engaged living, emotional, the, the breakout sessions, are they going to be facilitated by an expert who can facilitate those conversations? It's going to be one of our mental health professionals, it's going to be a parent, and it's going to be a student. So when we Excellent. say, we, they all have resources that they're trying to, because we want to make it as practical as possible for people, uh, and as reasonable as possible, like I said, that I went, if I went home tonight, I could do this. Excellent. Thank you. Sorry, I had, I had one quick question. It could be a typo or if you could clarify on that roadmap. Um, I don't see grade 7 on there. I, it, is grade 7 not getting any of these programs? We, we have it mapped for the DBT. It's 6, 8, and 10. Uh, that, that's where we, we have it. So we have it cycled like that. So that, oh, that, that kids okay. get. In, in seventh grade, they do get through their facts. They get success highways uh, in that entire curriculum, which teaches a lot of resilience and stress management. So we don't just take a pause in seventh so grade. There's we something know happening still, there. Yes. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. And just the zoo is well. He'll be zooming in the doctor, yes. but um, will it, the wellness summit be in person the, or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for clarity. Yeah. And so just a question, because it kind of follows up. I had been at the seat meeting earlier today, and I know the question sometimes comes up, you know, we should be focused very much on academics, and when we are adding in things like some of the, the screener and the social emotional wellness work, is that taking away from the academic piece? So the way I'm hearing it is that um, really a big focus is that the kids, in order for them to learn the best and, and really make the most of the teaching that's going on in the curriculum that's going on in the school, they have to be able to be emotionally present. And we hear more and more, I mean, it, not just in school, but I know it's happening at my kids' colleges and you, I read newspaper articles about the elevated rates of, of kids and adults with de anxiety and depression and things that are really debilitating and getting in the way sometimes with academic success. So is that kind of the intent, and is this a lot of it, like some of it, like it seems like like the kindergarten and elementary school programs, it's sort of embedded into how teachers are teaching, right? So as they're doing the academics, they're also getting a chance to practice some of these skills, is that, am I uh, getting I that right? To, to a degree, yes, and, and our hope is over time, these things, because they're, they are relatively new, that we want them to become part of the, the language of vernacular of the district. Mm -hmm. um, I can say already that I, I can hear kids, and I've seen even adults say, one of the DBT practices, you don't say, you don't make a statement and say, but that, because then you erase the former part of it, it's that you have this end, these two things that exist simultaneously. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard the reference to wise mind. 
uh, that, you know, in terms of how I'm thinking and how I'm working. And, and it's great to see the kids recognizing that they need to be aware of other perspectives and how important it is, how important it is for them to take a breath and to think about it so that they're not re responding emotionally. Um, if, if, that, if we can have the, our kids go off with those skills, I think then we've done a good job. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, board, we're just going to go ahead and change the device here and see if can, Chris can get on here. So we've got. Tempting feet. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> we have our energy performance contract piece coming forth. As we know, um, we've been at, at this work for uh, just a little bit of time and getting it going, but we'll see um, as we walk through this one part. So. If, if, if you would be okay, Lindsay, could we hit a couple of next items? And then Absolutely. we'll just see if we can open so up on the while, other device again. While we're waiting, yep. uh, that we are now in acceptance of the financial reports, so that will be taken care of. I can, we can move to minutes as well. Be it resolved that the Board of Education, having received copies of minutes of the meetings of 920 and 1011, hereby approves the same motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Shall we keep going? All right. Yes. Um, all right. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to get back because I know everyone yep. wants to see the boilers. Yes. Of course. Yes. Uh, <laughs> all right. So let's move to the personnel consent agenda. Be it resolved, the Board of Education, upon recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, hereby approves the attached personnel agenda. Motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstained? All right, CSE, CPSC, be it resolved, the Board of Education having received copies, recommendations of the meetings as listed in the attached memo, hereby approves the same motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstained? Can we put you on the spot, Chris, and talk about the business consent agenda? Be it resolved, the Board of Education upon recommendation of the superintendent hereby approves the attached business consent agenda. Motion. So moved. Second. Second. Chris? I think just a couple things I wanted to highlight. Uh, annually, the Board of Education has to adopt the budget planning calendar for the district, mm -hmm. which, again, it's only October. It seems strange, but yes, we're already planning for the 23-24 school year. Um, and then there's also an amendment to the agreement with H2M Architects and Engineers, who is our architect firm for the district. Uh, this is in regards to a new project at the high school to upgrade. Uh, change to a chlorination system at the high school as being required by the Department of Health. Thank you. Questions? And then there's those four legal notices, the public hearings on the budget vote at the very end for public to see. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Excellent. Stipulation of settlement. Be it resolved, the superintendent of schools is hereby authorized and empowered to execute the stipulation of settlement signed on September 23rd uh, by the parents of a student. And the superintendent is further authorized to take action necessary to effectuate the terms of this agreement. Motion? Yep, so moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Okay. Uh, next stipulation agreement, be it resolved, Superintendent of Schools is hereby authorized and empowered to execute the stipulation settlement signed on September 30th, uh, 2022, by the parents of student uh, 4XX6, and the superintendent is further authorized to take all action necessary to effectuate the terms of this agreement. Motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Okay. Uh, the uh, board action around the Team Tuskers Mentoring Volunteers. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education of the Somer Central School District hereby appoints the following volunteers assigned as mentors and our community members for the district's Team Tuskers Mentoring Team as presented here. And I'd just like to take a moment and say thank you to all of our community members who have raised their hand to participate in this way in support of our students in this community. So thank you. Motion. So moved. Yeah. How, how many people are in this group? So uh, there's about 20 that are on the. Second. Can I I'm second? Sorry, second. 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 Sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Second. Right. Second. Discuss. All in favor? Oh, sorry. Discussion. Yeah. Sorry, Faye. No, so I, there's you, about 20 or so individuals right now. And so, as the board may recall, um, when we first started this uh, mentoring program about a decade ago, um, we started with a very small group, about seven students. We got up to just before COVID about over 70 children. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately we've, we've lost some mentors and things like that, but we're back in about 20. And so we 
anticipate we'll keep moving forward with this. So it's uh, actually uh, uh, last night. Yeah, uh, we had a meeting here last night, having some of their mentors meet their their mentees. So we, we don't have problem of uh, feeling the quota or needs. We need, uh, more. We need more mentors. We need more. We need okay, so there, more so there mentors. Are, right. yeah. We can get more mentors. Things? Absolutely. No. Just go ahead and and <laughs> okay, uh, email uh, certainly my office. There's a mentoring dot uh, as on the site. We've got information in there. Phyllis is our coordinator of that work and things. So there's or look in the newspaper usually in there about every other week in the summer okay, record. Okay, we'll stuff, do so. some recruiting. There we go. So <laughs> anybody who's best. listening, anybody who's yep. here right now, thank you for showing up. If you'd like to consider being a mentor for one of our students, opportunity. Yes. Yes. Thank you. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? And then we are back to Chris, I think so. Oh, thank yep. So tonight we have Mike Wieson here from Johnson Controls. Uh, just to kind of recap where we came from and how we got here. A couple years ago we partnered with Energia to develop a request for proposal for an energy performance contract. Um, one of the biggest factors there was to replace some aging boilers and then as many of you have seen throughout the district, uh, one of the other biggest components of the energy performance contract is replacing um, uh, the lighting and upgrading the, upgrading the lighting throughout the district. So from the point a couple years ago with the request for proposal, Johnson Controls was the energy service company selected to move forward with the energy performance contract. And uh, back in May of 2021, the voters approved the energy performance contract, which allowed the district to receive an additional 10% in state aid on the project. So now it took about almost a year for it to get uh, approval from the state education department. And then construction began sometime back at the end of June and throughout the summer. Um, so Mike Wieson, again here from Johnson Controls, is going to give us a little update and has some nice pictures of some of the aging equipment that was replaced uh, in this project. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Mike Wieson. I'm with Johnson Controls. I'm the construction manager for the energy project. And I know it's going to be pretty hard to look at some of these graphics up there, but uh, <laughs> we'll do the best we can. Can we get to the next table? Well, if you could read this, this has the, this is the scope of work for the entire project. It's called an ECM list. There's 21 different items that we've executed under the contract. Uh, and if you were to follow them, the, the columns list the percent work completed for each of the ECMs. So I, I don't know how much we want to get into detail on this <laughs> stuff. I mean, it's, there's a lot of um, numbers up there. But the bottom line is right now we're, we're at about 70% executed on the work. So we're about essentially 70% complete with the project as, as a whole. Is, is that about where you'd expect to be now or a little ahead? A little we're pretty much right on, right on yeah. what we anticipated, yes. I'm yeah, I would certainly say what the, the initial piece with our boiler system here is fully complete and operational. Obviously, that was uh, primary up for the team. So, the, all with the exception of one boiler, but there are, every school has the, has a new boiler functional yes. right now. Yes, so we know we have the backups to getting ready to get online and stuff like that. So, thanks. Correct. Mike. Correct. Yes, we anticipate having substantial completion of the whole project by February. Yes, the whole project basically completed by then. Okay. And there are some some before and after pictures. These are the boilers. The bo I know it's pretty difficult to see, but on the left are the old boilers. On the right, there's a picture of the new boilers. This so is I know the board, this is the walk yeah. that you had done in the summertime when we went through before the EPC contract uh, kind of started mm -hmm. initiating. So one of the major lifts in here was the boilers. So I appreciate Mike pointing that out. So again, this is the uh, Primrose campus and old on the left and new on the right. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the boilers were obviously the driving force on the project. Yes. So the, yeah. The, yeah. yeah. Just one question. Uh, the the inflation situation will not have an impact on this project, right? No, the, you Good. mean the thank uh, you. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna actually jump in there. One of the inflation pieces you're helping us with the cost of actually running these boilers is yes. going to be less than what it was beforehand. So correct. These yeah. these boilers are much more efficient yes. than the older boilers yeah. by far. Yeah. In fact, everything we've done on the project is saving a lot of energy. Yeah. We've, all the lighting we replaced with LED lighting, which is a, yeah. a big benefit to the district. And with the boilers, we had been paying a lot for repairs, too. Certainly. The maintenance was yeah. getting difficult. 
fabricating parts and the whole thing, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, this is the high school boilers. I, I know it's a little difficult to see. Garbage. These are domestic hot water heaters. Collecting water. <coughs> and that's just some lighting, some examples of befores and afters. There was a significant amount of lighting retrofitted throughout the buildings, correct? Pretty much all lighting. Yeah. yeah. And one thing I'm noticing on the top of the slides that shows what the wattage was of the old light bulbs versus mm -hmm. the new. So you can see where we'll have energy savings there. Yeah, it's pretty substantial in some situations, yes. But the light output is greater, it looks like, right? Yeah. And it's a wider Earth. light, too. Yeah. Yeah. The fluorescents are more of a yellowish. That's a good point. Mm. The floodlights. I like Excellent. the pictures. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Mike. Thank That's you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. All right. So uh, it looks like we have emerged at our second public comment. So all of you who are here to make a comment to the board. Uh, about an item that was not on the agenda. Uh, we would like to ask that all speakers properly identify themselves. Just as a reminder, there's a piece of paper at the podium if you could write your name and your email and the school that your child attends so we can respond to you. Um, again, we have a maximum of 30 minutes in our policies, which limits to three minutes per speaker. Uh, speakers may comment on matters of public interest involving school operations and programs, but again, you may not criticize or personally attack any individual connected with the school district. No district employee or student may be commented upon or identified by name or situation. Questions asked by the public will be referred to the appropriate staff member uh, who will reply at a later date or time. Again, questions requiring investigations will be referred to the superintendent for consideration and later response. And all written statements, please, shall be given to the district clerk for inclusion in the records of the meeting. So public comment is now open. Hi, my name is Paul Trevardini. I spoke last week. Sure, sorry. Uh, before I start, I'd like to say I attended the seat meeting this, earlier today, and I thought the content was very appropriate. There was good conversation. The topics were wholesome and family-oriented. If if that were if if that is where it ended, teaching children, it would be great. Good citizens, driven, and highlighting members of the community that promote inclusion, and making sure everyone is heard and listened to. I'm all for that. Who would not be for that? So how do you prove to me that this program will not go off the rails? It would have to start with the leader of the program. But first, having grown up in this town, I can't recall a time when I felt, felt it imperative to attend a board meeting. There was a trust that members of the board and the superintendent would make decisions that aligned with the fabric of the people who elected them. Today, most people in the town don't have the time to attend the three-hour board meeting to ensure the integrity and trust are upheld, while conflicts of interest through belief structures are held at bay. I'm here again tonight to voice my concerns about the hire of the activist as DEI leader. The message from the community last Tuesday night was that concerned parents do not oppose the DEI position, but we fiercely opposed to the radical activist that has been shoehorned through the hiring process. Had it not been for the Somers record, most of us here would still have no idea about the hire. Respectfully, the board members offered some answers that evening, but answers were fraught with process and hiding behind process was, has not helped build trust. The action to move so drastically towards a radical for this position is perplexing. By definition, wouldn't a person whose job it is to unite our student body have to be balanced and non-divisive? This is a decision that will divide people in the town. It will divide our children, some of which do not even see color or race yet. What recourse will the teachers have when the curriculum threatens their moral compass? The teachers are the choke point to administer this ideology. It will divide teachers that don't want to teach it while you hang their paychecks over their heads. Dr. Blanche, this was a missed opportunity for you to highlight your alignment with the community of which you are also a resident. Most of us know the decision to move forward with this person who has co-authored teaching as protest is misaligned with the town of Somers. Regardless of whether this person chooses to assume responsibility for the book or not, Perhaps the podcast she gave on the book's content was also not her. To think the excuse is coming from an adult who will have input into my child is laughable. 
Approving this hire is an admission that you are willfully accepting the risk of division within, our di within, within your district, as well as accepting fabricated stories as gospel to support your hire. It is extremely naive to believe that she will not bring her manifesto of ha hatred into the classroom. I am strangely fascinated by how dug in you are that this is the right person for the job. What is it about this person that gives you such conviction that she will not bring her bias into the classroom? What protections will students, parents, and teachers have? Because I can tell you, it may not show up in her 30 or 60 or 90 day plans, but, it, but this poison will eventually leak into all facets of the district. Limiting transparency and operating in secrecy not only destroys trust, but creates perception, perception issues that something was done that was either corrupt or deceitful. If you are so confident that your decision is what the residents and parents of this community want, I would urge you to call a referendum vote on this topic. If your conviction is so strong that your decision is what is best for this town, we should se settle this with a democratic process. Ideas have consequences, and bad ideas have victims. The idea of hiring this new DEI leader is a bad idea, and the victim victims will be the family and the children in this town. Make no doubt about it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Thank you for sharing your concern and your perception issues. Um, we appreciate your coming and sharing your concerns here. Oh, well, there is a pen here. I'm like, no one else wrote their names. Sorry? Said so no one else wrote their names. <laughs> oh. Um, we would appreciate if you would write your name. Um, my name is Charlotte St. Rose. I'm a member of the com community. I have three kids in the school district. And I would like to take this opportunity to um, thank the board members who are volunteers who dedicate their time, selflessly so, and to Dr. Blanche who continues to make brave decisions even in the face of personal attacks and unwarranted attacks, and to the staff members who are focused on the district's effort to improve our DEI um, initiatives in the school. As parents, we all want the same things for our children. We want them to exist in an environment where they are both physically and emotionally safe. We want them to learn and demonstrate confidence in their abilities. We want them to feel like they have the right to exist in whatever space they choose to occupy. We also want to give, we also, we want them to be given the opportunity to be the best versions of themselves, whether it be extra academic help, um, access to school counselors to help them work out difficult situations, or be educated in an environment free from racism, ableism, and other forms of bigotry. But at the same time, we want them to know that their actions matter and that they have impact and that their actions have impact on those around them. And is it incumbent on, um, incumbent on us as parents and educators um, and those responsible for educating them to make sure they get the proper guidance. And I see the, um, the actions that the, the district has taken so far has all been towards making sure that our children live in a more equitable, in a more you know, safe space. And I know these are hard decisions and I know hard choices have to be made. And I know this is a really hard time in our country and how divisive in the environment is, but I see the actions that you all are taking from the board to the district as all very positive and all towards bringing the community together. I know we all see this in different lenses, but I just want to commend all of you for the brave work that you're doing. I am a member of this community and I appreciate your effort. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. St. Rose, for your comment. Hi, good evening. My name is Virginia Sheridan. I have a student in the high school and one that recently graduated. I really wasn't planning on speaking tonight, but I feel compelled to. Because somebody mentioned that a recent addition to our team here is going to bring biases and poison. I, I, I'm sad to report those are here. And I feel like we're finally making some way overdue progress in breaking those down. 
I don't want kids who have additional support needs to be made fun of for wearing their noise-canceling headphones in the hallway. And I don't want my children to come home and ask why it's acceptable in our schools to hear the N-word every day, multiple times a day. I don't want my kids to come home from school and ask why a student was allowed to read from racistjokes.com in a classroom. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're finally making progress. So thank you for making the difficult conversations to make progress so that we're not listening to and experiencing those behaviors which create an unsafe environment for our children where they cannot thrive socially, emotionally, or educationally. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sheridan. Thank you also for writing your name so we can get back to you. Appreciate the comments. Hello, uh, my name is Gary Portnoy. Um, so there are, were a lot of people this week and last week standing here and offering opinions on the book that they're offended by. Uh, but this isn't a book club, right? If the complaint is really about the book, then congratulations, this book isn't part of the school curriculum. It isn't in any of the school's libraries and the person who wrote it isn't actually teaching that book to our children. Also, there are many more books, PhD dissertations, journal articles, and academic papers written by different members of the school community. Should we come to the Board of Ed meetings and speak about all of them? If we're being honest, it seems to me that most complaints aren't against, are against the concept of DEI. So at least let's call it for what it is so we can talk about it in the open. I also have kids who are white. They're also Jewish and part Russian. That's my fault. Um, and I also don't want them to think poorly of themselves because of any of those things. I have talked to them about the harm white people caused in the past through colonization and slave trade years ago and even more recent in our recent history. But they think no less of themselves because of those things. Just like they don't feel any guilt about their or mine Russian roots over what's currently going on in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And why would they? They're proud of who they are, they're proud of their heritage, and even at 12 and 14, they're able to think and talk about these complicated topics without it damaging their fragile ego. I'd like to think that we all teach our children to be good people at home. But as someone whose kids have gone through the school system from Primrose to high school, I have to say that in my personal experience, some parents are failing at that job. I wish we didn't need DI curriculum. I wish we could spend the money and time on math, technology, writing, but I will reluctantly give up the time for these content areas if it means my kids will be less likely to see swastikas in the bathroom, hear the R word in the hallways, or see racist or homophobic comments in group chats like iMessager on social media. Take your kids' devices, look through them. It's pretty educational. There's no evidence that anyone in our schools is teaching kids that they're racist, just like there's no evidence that talking about it makes it worse. We didn't talk about racism in the 30s and 40s and there was no racism, right? Started talking about it in the 50s and 60s, and bam, it's everywhere. I heard lots of comments here about our white children, especially last week. But you have to know that not all students are white, just like they all aren't straight, cisgendered, or neurologically typical. I'd like to think that we all want all of our kids to be comfortable in our schools, which is why I fully support the DAI effort and the hiring of a new coordinator, and I will evaluate them based on the actual changes I see in the district going forward. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Portnoy. Uh, good evening. My name is Paulina Beric. We met a week ago. Uh, just a short comment to parents so the it's not about books. It's about this important position nowadays, DEI. And the point is that person needs to be non-biased, right? So when person's years of writing is based on very radical agenda, we don't want that person to be teaching. So it's not about who wrote what, it's about bias. And people teaching should be non-biased. The school should be neutral. 
neutral of politics, then we'll be neutral of hate. Mm -hmm. And yes, parents should do their job at home. Thank you. That was short. Thank you. Thank you so much. Give me a second to sign first because I'm going to forget. I have three kids. Hold on a second. <laughs> um, my name is Anna Valentine. I have three children, SIS, SMS, and SHS in the school district. We've been here for five years. I want to just comment on some other issues that were covered earlier today. Um, I had an issue with the SEW, Social Emotional Work Acronym. Maybe you could think of another word because it sounds like a sewer. So SEA, <laughs> maybe, like Social Emotional Alliance or Avenues. I don't know, but that just didn't sound too good. Um, regarding the DBT skills that are starting in, I think, SIS, or I don't know if they were starting at Primrose, my third grader can now very calmly look at me and say, Mommy, you seem angry. Mm -hmm. And that diffuses everything, and I'm very thankful that she's learning how to label her feelings in school <laughs> because it helps me manage her at home, so thank you for that. Um, we're all biased. There's no such thing as anyone not being biased. If you're a human being and you have lived experience, you are biased. Um, so it, it's just impossible. You cannot hire a neutral person unless you hire a robot. Um, I, I strongly recommend for people who struggle with the idea of racism existing, I recommend taking an undoing racism workshop. It is eye-opening, insightful. Um, very powerful, and I can tell you personally that I know people who were adamant that they were had no biases in them and came out of the workshop realizing how so many insignificant things that don't seem like a big deal are ingrained with our biases. Um, so listening to some of the comments tonight and yesterday, I think it was, or last week, um, just reaffirms how desperately the DEI leader, specifically the one you have hired, is needed in this community. So I applaud you for everything that you've done and the hard work that you face every day. Um, so I thank you, the board, uh, the superintendent, and the staff of the school uh, for all the work that you're doing together to improve community and ensure that everyone feels welcomed and included in the community. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment, Ms. Valentin. You don't look really angry to me. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Sharon Page. I have two children in the district in Primrose and SIS. Um, I wasn't planning to speak tonight, but I was moved by the presentation about the social emotional wellness and lots of the comments that I've heard. Um, some of the highlight, oops, sorry, some of the highlights that stood out to me in the earlier presentation, I actually wrote down some quotes. Uh, when we are not well emotionally, we are not able to learn. Supporting students overall is the most valuable way to support their learning. Sorry if I'm misquoting a little bit, but I think I captured the gist. And when we acknowledge and name an emotion, we're less moved by it. And when you address a feeling, you're already taking positive steps. Um, to me, a lot of these ideas speak to the importance of DEI work and in this district and beyond, because also when you acknowledge and name a problem, you are less moved by it. Um, and while many people want to call out red herrings as an attempt to delegitimize the role and the need for DEI work in this district and the role of the DEI leader in this district, it's apparent that it's increasingly necessary. We can disagree and have conversations about the folks who occupy those roles. And by all means, it seems like people are open to having those conversations. But the need for DEI should be apparent for all families who care about the wellness, belonging, and dignity of all the students in our district. That includes students of color, linguistically and ethnically diverse students, religiously diverse students, students with special needs, and LGBTQ students. And I just want to also 
thank the board, the staff, and everyone who's been a part of helping to establish that DEI work. Thank you for your comment, Ms. Page. Also for sharing your name with us. Hi, my name is Alex Kaloris. I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, actually responding to Ms. Page, who I actually agree with everything she just said. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about where this goes because we're teaching our kids things that are very impressionable. And where this gets into the workforce, where I'm going to speak about my personal experience, because we talk a lot today about, we all agree about doing right from wrong. We want to teach our kids to be you know, free thinking, make decisions for themselves. I think what you're doing in the program of mental health is so critical. Mm. But it becomes divisive on the nuance of who you select to fill these positions. And let me give you an example at work. We have to take training that we agree that we are all unbiased racist. You have to agree to that. And that is the catalyst that teaches the training in the workforce. And like we talked about tonight, people can't speak up. They're afraid to lose their job. But it is incredible to me that you talk about bringing people together. And the way to do that is to finger point and call all white people unbiased racist, and we're going to teach you about all the horrible things you are and how to fix that. And it's amazing to me, having lived in Westchester my whole life, grew up in Bronxville, went to school, went to a couple of high schools. We came to Somers. This was an amazing place. There are so many good people here. And yet, you want us to believe there's so many horrible things about it. If there are swastikas in the school, deal with that. If someone makes a racist comment, Deal with that person. I mean, that's how the real world operates. It's not making generalized statements that all these groups are bad, or all these people need to be taught, or all bias or racist, white people are bad, all this stuff. And it works both ways. So I would just encourage people here today, you have kids, raise them, treat them right from wrong. The school wants to have positions like DNI. Nobody here is disagreeing with that. But who you choose matters. And the fact that people are up here speaking and one individual will not look at them, it's very telling. And I don't need to name them. It's not you, Lindsay, it's to your right. It's very <laughs> telling. <laughs> and you could cite process, lawsuits, and all the rest. That was pretty clever. I have to give you. That was pretty yeah, good. Yeah, well, now he's awake. <laughs> but it matters. It's not, it's not a joke. It's not funny. Actually, it was, it was pretty humorous, I have to say. Yeah. I'm being respectful by taking notes of what individuals are saying. Right, I'm sure. I'm not going to be disrespectful to talk to individuals up front. You wanna... But the point is, it matters. Nobody's disagreeing with the position. Nobody's disagreeing that's not important. But you make selections like this, you should answer to that. And you have chosen an activist to come into a district that definitely needs help, but it's not as bad as you're portraying it to be. And perspectives and opinions work both ways. And by choosing a hard position on one side, you are just creating more division. And you will deal with the consequences. You will deal with more racism, more hatred, more anxiety with the kids. I mean, literally, you just showed therapy through K through 12. Is that what we want for our children? It's scary. The real world is tough, and you've got to raise them to deal with it. Thank you for your, thank you for your comment. Sure. Um, my name is Slava Lasbin, <clears throat> and just gonna be. I'm gonna make a comment and a comment. Uh, uh, he, somebody was use example of Russia invading Ukraine. One of the uh, reason they're trying to explain the action is that Ukrainian are Nazis. Mm. Just remember that how it's being used now nowadays. Thank you for the comment.
Hi, good evening. My name is Tiomara Gonzalez. I'm a Summers resident. I have two boys in the district, one in kindergarten um, at Primrose and one at SIS in third grade. Um, this is my first time speaking at a board meeting, but I am one of uh, many avid watchers of the YouTube channel board meetings when I cannot make it. Um, and I read every um, board doc uh, that is presented on Somers board docs, which is accessible to everyone. That's how I've been able to see the PowerPoint um, from a distance over there. Um, I would like to thank the board. Um, when my family moved here in 2017, um, we looked all over for houses and had a lot of concerns about moving into this community knowing that the population did not represent the cultural uh, identity of my family. Um, my children identify as um, Latinx and black, um, which did not feel um, represented in this space. Um, and I was very concerned about the outcomes and the perceptions that educators would have um, for my children as they came through this district and always wondering if there would be a lower set of expectations or assumptions about their behavior because of their background. Um, when I moved into this community, um, I had received nothing but welcoming, messaging, um, wonderful neighbors, uh, educators being very responsive, and I was very motivated to join the seat committee. Last year, uh, during my tenure in the seat committee, um, there was an incident in the middle school that was very appalling, um, where a student brought a noose to school. I could not believe in this district that that happened, which motivated me to be even more involved and try to understand and question what is going on in this district. Um, I, was, I was part of the, the discussion about the DEI coordinator hiring. Um, there were many members who were invited to participate in this process. It was holistic. It was representative. Um, and I believe that the district did a very good job in hiring this individual who I've met with and has seemed very receptive and thoughtful um, and critical and reflective. Um, and I believe the work today is the continuation um, at the seat committee of work that's been happening for the previous years and will continue to evolve. Um, I find it very, very interesting um, in a space of predominantly white folks in this room um, feeling that there is something being taken away or that some poison is going to somehow seep into their children's veins and educators are going to start infiltrating and indoctrinating their kids because of one individual hired who has written a book and is transparent about her beliefs and biases, which we all have. And yet every facet of this district has served to has served to represent many of the members in this room. It is not easy for me to come out and speak. I, I would like to say that it is very hard to be a minority in this space. Um, but I do want to thank the board for making this hire. Um, when people say we, that does not include me. I speak for myself. And I want to thank this board, the superintendent, and all members of the hiring process and educators who have been part of SEAT and reflective about the cultural, uh, the culturally responsive pedagogy and framework presented and, and required by New York State um, for the work that they have done. And I want to thank you for seeing me and making me and my family feel seen in this district. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment, Ms. Gonzalez. Okay. Hi, everybody. Rochelle Knights. So I grew my children up in the Ardsley School District. We moved here as my parents were older and wanted to live closer to them. What I just heard was <laughs> we looked to move to Somers and were very concerned that there were a lot of white people here. A lot of white people. Mm. And how was I going to be treated because we're not white? That, to me, is bias and prejudice. Bias and prejudice that you were afraid to move here because there's a lot of white people here. And yet, the next sentence was, but we were so accepted. Well, I'm glad. I'm really glad that you were accepted by all these white people who you thought we're going to be biased against you. And right there is the problem. Yeah. Right there is the problem. I think you should have a DEI curriculum. I think you should teach everybody to be nice to one another. I think you should. There's not one person that stood up here that said that the 
that the position should not be. Not one single person said that. And everybody that came up after said they all don't want the DEI person. That's not what they said. But I did hear you say that you were afraid to move into a community of white people because you thought they were going to be prejudiced against you. That's wrong. Teach that in the DEI curriculum. Hello, good evening. Uh, can you hear me? I'm sorry, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so first of all, I, I would like to be brief. I was actually moved to speak after all of these many speakers. I, I don't think I can possibly, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm first going to introduce myself. Ruth Froelich, I am a relative newcomer to this community. We moved here in 2021. I got a little bit emotional uh, listening to these people because I've heard from many speakers talk about how nobody here is against DEI, but yet every single thing they said and so many things that they expressed were actual expression of just that sentiment of being against a program that would teach our children and maybe some parents to be more inclusive and respect diversity. I am appalled, well, I, I, you know, I heard people say, well, I've just heard Ms. Shiamara, I'm sorry, I do not remember your last name, say how, um, you know, she, she, she has a bias against white people, but it was an expression of fear because she has possibly experienced bias in her life by some other people. We have lived experiences where, that are different we are all different from each other, and that's the problem that I see here as a, as a, sure, relatively briefly a member of this community, relatively recent newcomer, but I've seen, I've been shocked at what I've heard and what I've seen on social media in particular, expression of vile racism and hatred that I ha I'm sorry, I have to call it out by its name. But it was some of the people who claim so then in other, uh, in other fora that they are for diversity and inclusion. I find that these things are incongruous. I think that if you live in a predominantly white town, it is quite possible that you do not realize how experiences of others are different from yours and that you cannot possibly understand and, 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 and unless there's someone to help you have those difficult conversations with others and with yourself to understand your own biases so that you can move <coughs> forward in this life. So I am very grateful for this initiative. I would like my children to grow up in a town that respects empathy, that, uh, that, that teaches empathy, that respects diversity, that, and that truly feels, makes people feel included, and I do not think this is the case yet. And I do not say this as a general remark for every single person that I've met in Somers either. I have felt very accepted by many people that I have met, many great teachers, many great neighbors, uh, many great parents, but I have to say, the reality is that there is the other side, that it's an ugly side. And someone mentioned swastikas, and we've seen other, other vile expressions of, for example, regarding, dare I say, the Lincoln Hall and, and its residents. I do not even know if I dare bring it up for fear of what it might cause. But I am shocked by these things, and I think we should all be shocked, and we should all work towards something better than that. And I'm very grateful that you are doing that, and so I'm really deep respect, and thank you very much. And I'm sorry for this emotional speech. I, I must say, I, I, I thought I would be more composed, and in the end, I'm just glad I got up to support my colleagues and, my, and fellow parents. Thank you so much. Thank you for your public comment. Oh, yeah. Thank you for sharing your name and your email so we can respond. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeremy Newman, Somers resident. I have two children in schools. Uh, my daughter's in Primrose, my son is in SIS. Um, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> <laughs> um, lots of strong statements tonight, lots of good presentations. 
You know, one of the things I really liked was the, the yes and approach of some of the social emotional learning that's going on. Um, you know, as someone who in my professional life manages a large team of people, you know, I want to encourage the board and I want to encourage the folks here tonight to really try and judge the efficacy of this role and the person in this role by what they do and not what we think they're going to do. So, you know, very brief statement, but I would just encourage everyone here tonight to base the DEI program and the person leading it by what they do. We are eight weeks, give or take, into the school year, and we've got a long way to go. So by all means, put a magnifying glass and pay attention to what is being taught. That said, judge them by what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. If there are no further public comments, we move to the board member comments. Trustees. Go ahead. I mean, all I want to say tonight is I think this is democracy in action. I'm actually moved by this evening. I think I'm moved by the civility, the composure that everybody in the room has held tonight. I, I, I was able to hear so many different voices and perspectives. And although I don't have kids in the summer schools anymore, this is what I would want to see in the classroom. Like I would love to hear this kind of dialogue where it pushes thinking and pushes people to move towards justice. So I, I'm like honored to be in this room tonight. I'll piggyback on that and say that I appreciate hearing everybody's perspectives and I think that's so important and I feel like um, there seems to be a common theme as we sat in, in some, I was in the seat meeting today as well and I sat with everyone and, and you know, looking at the variety of perspectives and a common theme I've taken away from tonight is that everyone supports the DEI work and how important it is to have inclusion and respect um, in, our, in our school district. Um, so I think that's really important. And I'd also like to just add that last, this is um, somewhat related, but last week um, some of us went and visited the, both the high school and Primrose. Um, I, I was the one at the Primrose uh, meeting, so I'll let um, Heidi or, or Chad speak to the high school one if they want. But overall, I felt the themes there were just very, the teachers, are so invested in the work that they're doing and they feel, I think they feel supported. Um, and it was just so wonderful to see the kindergarten classrooms in action and, and see their lesson plans go throughout the day. Um, and we got, and I got to see the UPK rooms um, that have been installed and um, I can't even remember my kids being that little anymore. Um, but uh, it was so great to see um, all the teachers doing the lessons and seeing the students engaged and um, and it was a nice dynamic to see between you know the beginning of school and the end of school kind of thing on on, on the spectrum um, and I, I think one of the things I took away from that was uh, change is hard and uh, but it's uh, important and it's uh, uh, to have conversations and have everyone feel respected and heard along the way. And, um, and also that, uh, that the teachers all felt that no matter, even though that they felt that they were doing really great, they never wanted to settle and they wanted to always do better. And I think that is a testament to what we're supporting as a, as a school board and, um, and what we see as a district, so. Thank you. You can. If you want to go, I'm still just gathering. Oh, sure. No, I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, yes, uh, the three of us were able to sit in on um, uh, a, a leadership. Um, uh, 
I don't know, I wouldn't even call it a meeting because it was so much more dynamic than that. But it had a lot of the leaders, uh, different um, content leaders throughout the high school. And um, uh, it, it's just, it's fantastic to be able to see this lens into how they, how they work, how they, um, uh, how they view the future of, uh, of, of where they're heading and, and how they're teaching their, the, the students. Um, I, I know some of the things that I had written down, you know, the, the, they, they went around and, and discussed their aspirations. Um, uh, they were very reflective, um, but it, it was always, they, they were always so engaged with each other. And these are across all different content areas, which, which is always really exciting if, if anyone who's in the um, age of going to college, you know, interdisciplinary work is, is just fantastic. And, and it's really, it's really, I, I know it's just great for everybody. Um, but they all had these open minds listening to each other, um, a lot of humility about, um, about themselves and, and, you know, compared to what, what everyone was doing. Um, they're very reflective on, uh, um, you know, re reviewing their initiatives, and 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 and, and I could tell just the, the open minds, the aspirations they had for for moving forward, and, and really connecting and engaging our kids with with their um, with their learning is just terrific. So I appreciate very much every time we get a view into into the schools and, and how some of these things operate. Um, very exciting. I, I just want to also thank. This goes back to the high school, uh, I mean the whole, whole district, but homecoming, getting some of the, um, some of the events back, uh, having a homecoming dance, um, I, I think was, was pretty well in, uh, attended. I saw pictures, I, some of my kids were there and it was really, really great reviews, the bonfire. Um, I, I don't think anyone said what that football score was, but it was pretty impressive. Um, so uh, it, it just, it's great to see that, um, the pride, the, the pride of the school. I, I think it's important to have those and continue that. Um, I echo Mary Rose very much. Thank you everybody for coming out and speaking. It's important that we hear, we do listen, um, and we learn. We, we learn and, and all the different perspectives are, are really important. So I, I couldn't have said it better than you. The whole discussion is is really important. So thank you. Here, here. Mm -hmm. well done. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, so uh, again, I'll, I'll echo a couple different things. The uh, I, it was good to see the the homecoming, you know, uh, dance back. You know, my kids did attend that as well, and the bonfire and all those different activities for the kids were great. Um, you know, and thank you to all the volunteers and teachers that you know put in the time and you know, decorated that. Uh, that school gymnasium that uh, it did come out great. Um, the you know tonight you know the, the comments um, you know to talk about the common themes you know, you mentioned uh, it's it's the common theme I heard is I, I don't think anybody in the community doesn't um, or disagrees with the fact that we should have a DEI coordinator here right so um, and we do need to be having the conversation and teaching our our kids for how to you know uh, navigate and how to you know uh, grow to know each other right a little bit better um, you know and and be able to take that into whether it's you know college or their careers in our lives um, and in, in doing so right I 100% agree with you right it's it's creating that that safe space and being able to have those tough conversations there um, you know that's some things that you know I went through when you know and my own job and just being able to have some of those conversations with colleagues and you know we made sure that they were actually safe conversations that were able to happen two ways um you know so again i i do think we have to figure out um you know how how do we measure the success of this this role going forward right what is what does that mean you know how do we measure the fact that you know or this person in the role or whoever it may be but are they creating a safe space for all students um, do they all feel comfortable having that conversation um, and learning from one another and, and, and growing and developing because uh, without that then the it's not going to be successful um, again whether it's this person next person whoever it might be 
um, but the okay. students really need to be comfortable in the situations and the teachers need to be comfortable in the situations uh, in being able to either speak up to the administration and, and talk about certain things and or uh, talk to students or students talking to other students and, and just understanding one another. Um, so I, I'd like to hear, you know, uh, no, it's not now, but over time, whatever it might be, right? But we you have know, more, you know, how we're going to measure that success, how we're going to actually be able to make sure that, you know, all students do feel, you know, in a safe environment and in those conversations. Great. Okay. I, I just want to be uh, brief, um, a little bit hungry. <laughs> got a cookie. Okay. Right here. <laughs> well, one of the things that being a, a school board member is <laughs> the, is uh, the enjoyment of uh, learning from the community. Mm. Because sometimes when I walk on the street, people actually do come to me and w want to say something. <laughs> Otherwise, I probably have very few friends that want to talk to me. <laughs> so that's one of the benefit. Uh, now it looks like, you know, you can hear on the you know, two sides of the aisles. It's almost like a, you're in the Congress, you know. You oh. hear both sides of stories, uh, debate and so on. And as he, you know, I'm not white and uh, you hear both sides of stories and I understand both, you know, arguments. And uh, I'm not a historian, but I read a lot. I, I really enjoy reading, and I think history is the best, you know, textbooks. If you read history, you will understand some of the issues. They will go away, okay? Uh, if you take that advice, try it. Just read some books. Uh, you learn a lot. I, I learn from school also. If I'm not on the board, I probably don't learn that much. For example, like today, this... Uh, social, emotional well-being thing. You now when kids are grown, I don't have any input. I don't really get you know, into that anymore. You won't learn that. And this presentation probably is the first. I hope we'll get more. In fact, I'd like to see more because this issue is not just students in school. It's also in family, in home. Uh, I think uh, I read also some researchers talk about, uh, I don't know your term, uh, the term called TRF. Uh, I don't know anybody heard of TRF. It's teacher report form for every student. Every student, okay? It's almost like special ed, you have a, you know, a, a special report for every, but this is t talking about general student. This is, you know, students emotional, you know, a social emotional welfare thing. Uh, the teacher report is sort of like a survey screening documentation results of a particular student. And I think that might be a good idea for a school that really having tools, have monitoring every student and have ability to generate a TRF and from the TRF, we can study what are the issues, you know. And I, I mentioned before, you know, homework anxiety, test anxiety, okay, relationship, you know, peer relationship or teacher, student, all these things are part of the problems. <coughs> but they're not applied to everyone. Everyone's different. Mm -hmm. So this TRF, some research, you know, actually document that and uh, say is is way of to sort of track kids from kindergarten all the way to high school graduate uh, to make sure they really, you know, grow to be a sound citizen. So those are things I learned. I, I really enjoy that, and I hope uh, um, our teachers will come back to have more discussion on this and to see how we are doing, particularly now with some of the tools. Uh, there are several acronyms I forget now. Tools that uh, you can use for this SEW, SEs, whatever. So um, no, that's not brief, right? Thank you. I'll end here. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yes, we can. Didn't say a word. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, Ife. So uh, I'm, I won't be brief, probably, because I had a couple things that I wanted to be able to share with you. Um, uh, you know, the high school, visit, it's so great that we're able to get back into the class, back, back into the schools. I think I was definitely feeling a little disconnected there when we weren't able to get, you know, into the school buildings and interact with the teachers and kind of felt a little out of touch with what was going on in there. So it's wonderful that we have these visits back again. And thank you, Ray, for um, thank you. orchestrating that. So I was able to go, I couldn't go to the Primrose one, but I was able to go to the high school um, meeting with the leadership team. Um, and it, yeah, it really was an inspirational experience. I wish everybody, we, I wish we could like videotape it and just kind of show it as a little snapshot of what goes on behind the scenes. Because I think so often that's what we don't realize is, is the work that's going on by small groups of people behind the scenes. Because it's always, everybody can't do everything all together. You'd get nothing done. And you always have these small leadership groups that are that are really working together and doing the work. And so that's what it was. It was the leadership team. Um, and they were basically kind of going through an exercise as we're doing in different groups throughout the district right now as we're looking at our goals and our vision and our mission moving forward. And they were reflecting on um, they were reflecting on some of their successes, and then they were just and they were discussing those strengths and some of their aspirations, and you know a little bit. Of, and we were as board members told to kind of listen and hear, you know, what makes them proud of of you know, of Summer Central School District, um, and just some of the things that I had heard. You know, I definitely heard a lot of pride coming from these teachers, and a lot of a lot of commitment and a lot of um, connection. And you know, little things like you know, commenting that oh, the IB consultant that had come to work with them had commented that they'd never had a more engaged staff to work with. And they felt proud of being part of that engaged staff that this consultant con uh, commented on. Um, and uh, they talked about community lunch and how that you know, the, really high, the return to it after having lost it really highlighted that sense of community and how it transformed the school and how it had a collective sigh and reflected on the fact that it had been a hard thing to embrace and there had been a lot of difficult conversations as they came to those schedule changes and how in the leadership team as they're meeting and they're planning those, those changes, they have a little charter that they operate on so that they can have spirited and difficult discussions but in a way that everybody feels safe and they can eventually come to consensus. And hearing walking through that process was, you know, and hearing the teachers discussing that and how they had sometimes really disagreed on things that were going to happen and been able to ultimately focus on what was in the best interest of the students and then reflect on it later and say, yeah, and you know what, you were right. Like, what, we, what change we made was for the best interest of our students. So just kind of hearing that process was just an incredible thing to be a part of. Um, you hear your comments, constant push to keep getting better, proud to be a part of it. Um, and one of the things that somebody did acknowledge, you know, they said they acknowledged that for some, for other staff, um, that if you're not part of that leadership team, sometimes it can be easy to feel a little blindsided or in the dark and not quite know when something new is co comes out of that leadership team and then the other staff are being asked to do it. And I think we see that all over, you know, in the community and, and in the school district too, that there's always groups working and when it comes out, how, and they were, you know, there was speculation on how do we, how do we um, have, an, what, what, this is a good opportunity, how do we make the work visible to other, the rest of the faculty? Again, as a board, as a school district, how do we make the work and the decisions visible? Obviously, you're not gonna show every single meeting and every discussion, but how do you instill that trust that sometimes there's just not a trust and understanding and how do we work towards that and finally the final quote I'll share from that was um, one of the administrators that said yes change is hard but it's possible when people understand the why and when their emotional needs are being met um, and that theme I've really been carrying through as we as we talk about our work as a board as the conversations have come up at, at seat and then again at our at our seat meeting, that was that was coming up too because you know next thing I was able to do was go to the seat meeting, um, and there's work there. But definitely like the table that I was a part of, it was a little bit of a challenge. We had trouble getting through the work that we were kind of tasked with on on the seat plans because there was a little there was some not understanding 
there were some questions as to why we were there and why we were even doing this work at the table that I was at. And so that kind of stemmed our, our conversation a little bit. Um, and so it, that opened up that, well, again, we need to have conversations and have people have a, a, an ability to ask questions. What I love about public comment is it makes us sit here and just listen. And while you're listening, you're not trying to frame, how am I gonna respond? How am I gonna defend myself? What are my questions? But you have to, it forces you to sit back and listen and really process without instantly making a judgment call and instantly making an answer. And then there's places for question and answer. And that leads me to thank you for um, setting up the question and answer that you had on Monday. I appreciate taking that time. I know, and thank you to the PTAs who have been um, giving um, Skanswitz an opportunity to meet there and um, get to meet some, some parents when, cause, because there's obviously an interest from the, with a new staff member that's throughout the district. Um, I appreciate that you took two hours, I understand, with question and answer. So there, the district is, oper is providing those opportunities and when we know that it's, it's needed and wanted. Um, I also wanna thank you because I wanna acknowledge that you should never have to be in a position where you have to physically defend anybody on our staff. Mm. And um, I'm sorry that you were put in that position while you were trying to do good for the Good for the school district and the and the community and appreciate that that opportunity was there and last thing is i'm really looking forward to our next board meeting where we have the whole child report i know we talk a lot about high school yes. and at the whole child report we'll get to hear how our students are doing um, in terms of engagement and how they're doing in terms of um, and academically from the elementary grades right through high school and even as they go off to college so uh, that's our november meeting so um, we're, this is a very um, interesting time in our country and in our community. And my default is to say that we're not special in having these concerns and having these debates. But I'm wrong because I think we are special. And I think Mary Rose just called out why we are special. We have categorically different understandings of things, I think maybe as several of you have said. But my goodness, the way that everyone showed up tonight and shared their concerns, which really just comes from all of us loving our kids and wanting to make sure that all of our kids grow up to be happy and safe and successful humans, whatever that takes, um, is really extraordinary. So, you know, I just thank you. Um, I see that there's this tension, and I felt it since we joined the board, that there's this constant tension between let's get better, let's get better, let's do this new thing, and then what are the metrics we're using to know that the thing that we just did is useful to our kids and to their futures, which ultimately is in, in, in a school board. I think that's sort of what we should be asking. Um, so thank you for calling that out. Um, something that I was thinking about quite a bit as everyone was talking is that these initiatives are responsive to our kids that are in front of us because we're here for our kids, all of them. Um, they're not just responsive, but they're impactful. And so I agree, I think we need to really look at what are those metrics that we're using to evidence the impact of the programs that we're implementing, right? Um, I think that that's, we need to keep coming back to that as a board and asking those hard questions to make sure that we are accountable because ultimately, it, friends, it's not even us, it's our kids that we need to be accountable to. Um, that's my opinion, I can't speak for you. Um, so I feel like we're having growing pains a little bit. Um, and so, you know, we're all learning and we're getting better, hopefully. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, Nick and I had been uh, invited, thank you very much to the high school for inviting us to the IB Diploma Program, the five-year review, and the candor with which the faculty spoke and the students, oh my goodness, the students' representatives that were discussing the program and the impact of the program and the way that their language and communication and writing skills talk about interdisciplinary learning uh, was extraordinary. And to have the IB folks, this is an international program, to have the IB folks speak to us, we were on Zoom, uh, and, and talk to us about the impact of this program and the fact that they're bringing folks now to our school to see how to do this program because our learners are so successful and our, student, our, our educators are raising their hand to volunteer to be in this program. To me, like that's astounding. Um, so thank you to the educators that are watching, that are showing up every single day to grow and learn and support our kids and, and sign up to do these programs for us. 
Um, I'd like to put on the record right now that I'd like as a board for us to have a conversation about inviting a student ex officio member of the BOE, which is something that we've talked about for quite some time, but I'd like to put it on the public record and perhaps add it to a board conversation. If we're talking about raising student voice in the community, we should have a student member who sits on our board. Non-voting member, fine, but New York State law allows us to do that, and I feel strongly that you know, at least while I'm still here, I would like to, to see that that happens. Um, gosh, thanks. Um, yeah, and we had the first homecoming in two decades because again, you all showed up, right? Like everyone's showing up for our kids. And at the end of the day, that's all we all care about. We want our kids to feel safe. We want them to learn. We want them to thrive. Um, first homecoming in two decades. It's pretty magnificent. So thank you. Thanks for everyone who made that happen. Um, <coughs> Just thank you. Thanks for allowing us to, to, to be here and to learn and to grow and to listen with you. Yeah. Dr. Blanche. And that homecoming dance, that came from the kids, right? They had asked for it. Yeah. But what the community, what the parents, and what the teachers and the staff and the faculty did to make it, it was it gorgeous. It was, st if you didn't see it, please friends, go to the Facebook page because I think the Central School District has, has pictures. Mm -hmm. It was gorgeous and it was a labor of love like everything that we're doing here is. And I hope, I hope you all understand that. Sorry, please. No worries. So I'll just take, take, us, uh, take us down. So again, thank you to the board for the visits you've spoken about this evening. And again, we know we have around the corner of November some board members are gonna be a part of the Mid-Years Program accreditation visit here. So thank you again for that. And later in February, we have um, a group coming to the board to have um, a round table there conversation with a few students that will be there present and some faculty and some staff and having that conversation about the differences that they're experiencing in the schools and things like that. So again, that'll be coming. Um, I did uh, just want to give a board a hard copy. Again, it's, uh, it's digital on the website as we know, but of uh, the course selection guide at the high school. Um, if you have a moment to go ahead and cruise through that, you'll, you'll see the, the um, depth and the breadth of really the opportunities for our children to engage in a multitude of different opportunities to hopefully, again, follow that passion that we're looking at and, and for them and their, their mission work there. Um, kind of the, one of the last pieces, I want to start kind of where, or finish where Sarah started before. Sarah talked to us a little bit as our student leader at the high school and uh, talked about their students and their activities and things. One of the things in the district uh, we continue to do and work with our students is in the area of looking at um, our district mission and our vision and our purpose. And so our athletic team, uh, a number of years ago, we have a student athletic leadership council and they'll spend time looking at um, the purpose of athletics and we'll talk about the value of athletics beyond perhaps just the physical wellness of that. And so one of the identities that they've identified in there is the theme about honesty, integrity, respect, and service. So our children, that is a piece that is reinforced uh, practice to practice, game to game, conversation to conversation about how do we carry ourselves as student athletes with those kind of four constructs in mind. And so it brought to my thought about one of the things about being a little bit younger at some point in time, my age and folks in my life who, who I who helped instill some of those things in myself. I hope I can do the same for my grandchildren. And so did I too, and do I treat people with honesty and integrity and respect. Whilst we may not necessarily agree on things, how do we do that? Most recently, and Sarah actually mentioned uh, some of our events, our cross country team, just to give you an example of this in practice, and um, had a uh, meet recently in a school district next to us, not too far away. And uh, there was a, 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 court, a short kind of um, list of folks who were coming out of the uh, last kind of stretch of the finish. Two school districts were basically ahead of Somers, and uh, those districts came in very close. Last turn, it appeared that there was a uh, uh, cut across one of the runners there that was identified as a violation, and that team lost that event. What that meant for Somers was we would actually be identified as league champion. Even though we didn't win that race, we would be identified as a league champion. Our coach and his, the team who model kind of that expectation is that was there, identify that was actually not a violation. That was a piece that I would and put back in and then saying, look, I'm asking that you do not disqualify that runner or that team 
The reality is, is we're going we're gonna to go ahead and compete out there in an honest piece. Integrity says we win, we work, we hopefully do the best we can. And if at the end we do or don't, but we're going to win it appropriately and we're going to win it fairly, not by DQ. Took time, but ultimately that, that decision was reversed and our students did end up taking second in our league. Being here 13 years, we've won state championships, league championships, titles. I can't think of a time I've been more proud of our kids mm -hmm. than being second in that. They demonstrated what we've been talking about and what we hope to live our lives in with honesty, integrity, and respect. You should be proud of our children in our schools. So thank you, board. Did we get two awards? <laughs> I'm working on a second. So the, the piece is, is Ify, I think, again, we hear a little bit tonight. I, I would say don't worry so much about what children maybe don't listen to you. you know, we need to worry about that they are always watching us. So thank you, board. Well said. Good. Yeah. Be it resolved that this regular meeting of the Board of Education be adjourned. Motion. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Thank you. Thank you, board.